नमस्कार होप ब्रेन के इस कार्यक्रम कल्चर मैटर्स विद कैलाश मिश्रा में आप सभी का स्वागत आज हमारे वक्त वो नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया से हैं प्रोफेसर आलोक त्रिपाठी फ्रॉम आसाम सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी सिलचर और वो बताएंगे कि पूरे नॉर्थ ईस्ट में जो सात बहने हैं उसमें आर्कियोलॉजिकल इन्वेस्टिगेशंस क्या क्या हुए हैं उसमें क्या क्या समस्या है और किस तरह से उसमें और आगे काम करने की जरूरत है और क्या पोजिशनिंग है उनका इस सारी बातों पे हमारे पास है प्रोफेसर आलोक त्रिपाठी प्रोफेसर आलोक तो नहीं आ रहा है कोई कैन यू हेयर मी नमस्कार सर आवाज आ रहा है आपका फोक ब्रेन के आ रहा है आप लाइव हैं और फोक ब्रेन के इस कार्यक्रम में आपका स्वागत है और जो आज आपका टॉपिक है आर्कियोलॉजिकल इन्वेस्टिगेशन इन नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया और जो सात स्टेट्स हैं उनके बारे में उनके आर्कियोलॉजिकल इन्वेस्टिगेशन के बारे में आप लेक्चर देने जा रहे हैं आपके इस आपका इस ग्रुप में बहुत बहुत स्वागत है प्लीज नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स आई विल बी स्पीकिंग और रेदर आई विल ट्राई टू मेक यू अवेयर अबाउट archaeological investigations in northeast when we talk about northeast and when we talk about archaeology instead of going straight way on archaeology and its issues i would also like to touch certain related issues which are that what are the issues which generally people get confused so even when we talk about archaeology generally there is a, uh, a sort of uh, confusion because uh, people include each thing and everything in archaeology but when we talk about archaeology we are talking about search recovery analysis and interpretation of archaeological remains so understand it very clearly we are talking about about excavations we are talking about explorations to find out the hidden remains and northeast as you all know the eastern part of the country or extreme eastern part of the country is generally or popularly called as northeast india probably you may not be knowing that why we call it northeast because it's not in northeast this term originated some time back during the mughal period because it was lying to the northeast of bengal where the bengal sultanate was there and when british came they had their headquarters in calcutta so the assam that was a greater area that you can call it an ancient assam or greater assam which included all these uh, states it was lying to the northeast of calcutta so they used to call it northeast india became independent capital is in delhi if you see in present day situation of this region it is from delhi it is southeast and from the center of the country it is north northeast but in 1970s a law came where they used the term northeast region and since then it became an official sort of thing that people started calling it northeast india again a question arises do we need to call any region in the country by a different name when we are having a states that's a one important issue to be thought about ye vichar ki vicharni hai ki kya bharat ke kisi kshetra ko ek alag naam se jana jana chahiye ये इसलिए भी कि जब एक अलग नाम का प्रयोग किया जाता है तो वो एक एक अलगाव की भावना को कहीं पैदा करता है 
कि ये क्षेत्र इस नाम से है ये क्षेत्र इस नाम से है और हम जानते हैं कि नॉर्थ ईस्ट में एक अलगाववाद की समस्या भी फेस की थी सरकार ने तो ये बहुत विचारणीय तथ्य है कि क्या कुछ राज्यों को एक विशेष नाम से जाना जाना जाना, जाना चाहिए और शुड देर बी एनी नेम लाइक अ डिफरेंट रीजन इन द कंट्री हैविंग सेड दैट नाउ आई मूव टू द कोर इशू दैट टॉक अबाउट द आर्कियोलॉजी so let's take this region as a north east india which include uh, eight state now earlier there was seven states uh, recently one more state that is sikkim has been associated if you see the history of this part so the whole region was known as assam during british period or even during mughal period and there were two independent states manipur and tripura since independence these areas were slowly became part of the union of india and new states were carved arunachal pradesh mizoram meghalaya assam manipur tripura and sikkim nagaland so these are eight states now which are generally known as north east india since the sikkim has been very recently added so generally if you see anything written on north east india earlier you will find about those seven states because geographically also sikkim is away from these seven these seven states are uh, adjoining to each other then in between there is a bengal and then you have the sikkim which is coming between bhutan and nepal so these all eight states are called uh north east india and there is some similarity because uh, some of the problems or some of the issues which are related with the archaeology are a sort of common because uh, you will see them of course there are certain difference but there is uh, some commonality in between the, in them archaeology ke bare mein jab bhi baat hoti hai to people very uh, popularly say archaeologically assam is still terra incognita and even people quote this even today there is not only that even the mills in 1933 had written talking about archaeology the spade the chief tool of archaeologists has hardly been used in research in assam what systematic digging there has been on ancient sites has alas been done with the object of looting ancient graves ye mills ne 1933 mein kaha tha wo archaeology ke vishay mein baat kar rahe the to yahan ye dono tatthya jo hain apne aap mein sahi hain but the question arises that they are talking about what is the situation but we have to look beyond that we have to find out why this situation is there and how we can change this situation that is a bigger question and today we have to look at that at the past we have to see that why archaeology archaeological investigations could not take place like any other part of the country and when we analyze them then we have to look forward towards future and then we have to think ki now how we can and conduct better archaeological investigation so we have to look back to analyze and then we also have to see the present situation and then what should be done in the future so main koshish karunga ki in sare mudon ko samanya roop se touch kiya ja sake aur aap payenge beech beech mein jaise mills ne kaha ya jo pehle code tha usme assam shabd aata hai तो जब हम असम कहते हैं तो वास्तव में हम असम पूरे असम की बात कर रहे हैं जो यानी लगभग नॉर्थ ईस्ट को रिप्रेजेंट करता है और असम जो है एक सेंट्रल स्टेट है पूरी ब्रह्मपुत्र वैली को कवर करता है और साउथ में इसके बराक वैली है और बाकी जो स्टेट्स हैं वो छोटे हैं या बॉर्डर स्टेट्स हैं तो आर्कियोलॉजी की जब बात होती है या जब हम इतिहास की बात करते हैं तो मूल फोकस जो है वो आसाम के ऊपर आता है 
तो आसाम और नॉर्थ ईस्ट इन द पास्ट वॉज ऑलमोस्ट सिनोनिमस बिकॉज द होल एरिया वॉज नोन एज आसाम नाउ वी हैव गॉट दीज मॉडर्न स्टेट्स विच आर सेपरेट so assam may be used sometimes so that it means that we are talking about the northeastern region so if we see the previous works there have been many scholars and who have done uh, their dedicated works there and they were superior in scholarship and knowledge but if you want to analyze then you have to see something beyond that and so that is what we will try to see and then i am not going to talk about a particular archaeological site or a particular uh, excavation or a particular find because you would know if you know about northeast india you know there is a great diversity in flora in fauna in cultures there are different indigenous groups they have their own very colorful traditions their cultures are different from each other they have different languages they have different dialects so you find so much variety in northeast india and fortunately that many of these traditions are unaltered they are still preserved now because of the globalization certain changes are taking place but it's still their culture is preserved up to a great extent so you have a different variety which you just can't even think of or imagine what you find in northeast india and geographically and naturally this area is gifted it's a god's gift it's a beautiful it's like a heaven on the earth so it has different climate it has uh, altogether very different uh, situation there so you have to see in a different way and that is again a problem that certain uh, at times when a archaeologist uh, think about northeast he also feels that as he is doing archaeology in any other part of the country uh, the situation would be similar there but that's not the case because there is a difference so uttar purb mein jo apni vividhata hai jo wahan ki sanskritiyan hain wahan ke natural resources hain aur uske hisab se wahan ki jo यानी जो स्थिति है वो अपने आप में एक बहुत अलग है और अब जब हम पुरातत्व की बात करें या पुरातत्विक अन्वेषणों की बात करें तो हमको उन सब चीजों को भी ध्यान में रखना होगा और उसके हिसाब से जब हम अगर काम करेंगे तो हम जो है वो बहुत अच्छे या ज्यादा अच्छे रिजल्ट्स प्राप्त कर सकते हैं सो वेन वी टॉक अबाउट आर्कियोलॉजी और वेन वी टॉक अबाउट the development of archaeology uh, we know that it was the british uh, officers who started archaeological investigations in uh, india and these investigations were uh, limited to the you know the focus was on the antiquities of our india so in the initial stage when systematic archaeological investigations started during british india so northeast was not these investigation in northeast were not included there not only northeast not even the other part of the country they were focused mainly on the in the upper india and that is the up and bihar area and mainly their focus was on the buddhist uh, remains and james princep uh, very famously has said in asiatic society uh, talking about their objective of that time and the objective was more on the monumental heritage uh, i quote what the learned world demand of us in india is to quite certain of our data to place the monumental record before them exactly as it now exists and to interpret it faithfully and literally unquote so that was the basic concept when the field works started and as you know the northeast india is very rich in natural resources particularly wood and bamboo and most of the architecture there was made of uh, utilizing these natural resources and uh, in this wet and climatic uh, humid climatic condition they don't survive this organic material so you don't have huge monumental heritage there means 
huge monuments like other part of the country so the british focus was or more on the monumental records which was not there so definitely it did not attract them much because their intention was not to reconstruct the history of northeast india so therefore there was no proper focus which should have been right from the beginning so you see the difference there so it is a little late start there even in the lord canning when he talks in ashatic society he also talks about the documentation because that was their focus proper measurement preparing drawings and taking the photographs so that was the initial archaeological uh, idea I means idea in archaeological studies to document what exist so they were on what is already known record it there was not much emphasis on what is unknown and there has been a big change if you see the history of archaeology in india there are times when certain efforts were made to know something which is not known and that is real archaeology you have to make efforts to find unknown but it is convenient to focus on known preserve it record it document it and then uh, just to show it where you are sure so in less efforts you can show more but when you go for unknown then with more efforts you find probably the less so there has been a chance where the focus shifted from known and sometimes on unknown so british period was not uh, the british officers were not much interested in knowing about more unknown because their focus was on the monuments so their focus was on the monuments inscription and until the wheeler comes the wheeler we started a little more systematic archaeological excavation he also started the training but again his idea was not to make indians trained archaeologists rather he wanted his skilled main power to assist him and british archaeologists and with that intention the training was started and that is again an uh, that's good that indians were trained but if you see hindsight you will find that they were trained in digging or supervising the excavation and this tradition continued much for a long time almost unchanged and here we have to understand that archaeology is much means beyond digging or beyond retrieving the object search retrieval is a half part of that analysis and interpretation is a more skilled thing where you really find the result so archaeology up to the 40s were going in a different direction so i am talking in general about india so you can imagine northeast which is a little far away which is a very difficult terrain where you don't have a monumental heritage whatever you find that is all unknown so you need a altogether a different approach and that was not the approach of archaeologists during early time so therefore not much work was done and then the work continue of course there are certain people who visited and by chance they came to know about certain uh, remains or certain sites which they uh, recorded and reported the question comes that why we are concerned about archaeological studies in northeast india you know that history is generally based on the written documents or written records and when we talk about northeast india you will find that it really lacks sufficient or uh, written documents though a home dynasty we know which ruled in assam for around 600 years they have their records a uh, very good records uh, which are called burunji but all other indigenous groups which uh, lived in this uh, region they have their own traditions but they did not use the script 
So all their history is in oral form. They have their tradition, they have their customs, but they don't have written records. They don't have documents. So when there is an absence of written records, then we have to look at archaeology as a source to reconstruct history. Because archaeology is a source where by studying the material remains and by their analysis and interpretation, you can write or you can reconstruct uh, the past. So archaeology becomes more important in Northeast India in absence of or in areas where we do not have sufficient written records. So if you go by the strict definition of history, uh, one can say that before the arrival of uh, British, this is all prehistory because there is no script, no written records. So all their history goes before writing. And that is the period what is called prehistory. So they are without writing. And I'm not going in detail, even if you see certain tradition, which continues up to very late period. In other part of the country, uh, they dates differently. But here you will find they continues up to very recent time. And uh, two examples which I can give you, that is the polished stone tools, cells, and other tools, and the megaliths or megalithic tradition. We use, of course, the word megalithic, but megalith in southern India has a different connotation and different culture. But when you use megalith in northeast India, it's a living tradition. So there are similarities in forms. There are similarities in the shapes. But when you see them in the time, you will find there is a big difference. In other parts, they were used thousands, more than thousand years back. But here even they are used even today and they are living tradition. So therefore, Northeast require, you know, a different uh, approach altogether. And that is to be understood that why, how to go about, and then what are the issues which are associated with Northeast India. Northeast India, sirf duri se nahi aur wahan ke resources mein nahi but yadi aap unki sanskriti ko dekhenge ya aur kuch traditions ko dekhenge to wo baki anya kshetro se bahut alag hai unke shapes mein samanta hai unke roop mein samanta hai lekin agar itihas mein ya kal mein use dekhenge to dono ke beech mein bhari antar hai jaise megaliths ki hum ek shabd use karte hain megalith और वो बड़ा कॉमन यूज किया जाता है कहीं पे भी पत्थरों के बड़े बड़े बरियल्स या उनके दिखते हैं तो उसको मेगालित कह दिया जाता है लेकिन अगर हम दक्षिण भारत की बात करते हैं तो आयरन एज में वहां मेगालिथिक कल्चर थी उसी प्रकार के स्मारक जो है वो उत्तर पूर्व में भी मिलते हैं लेकिन अगर यहाँ पे वो प्रथा आज भी प्रचलित है तो वो प्रथा यहाँ पे जीवंत है इट्स ए लिविंग ट्रेडिशन वहां पे वो आयरन एज की है पुरानी है यहाँ पे वो आज भी प्रचलित है और अगर उनके आप शेप देखेंगे तो बिल्कुल वही शेप है जो वहां होते थे और कुछ अलग शेप्स भी हैं। आई टॉक अबाउट देम व्हेन वी कम ऑन दैट और जैसे पॉलिश स्टोन टूल्स है वो एक बहुत बड़ा है जिसको नियोलिथिक कहते हैं लेकिन यहाँ नियोलिथिक जो है एक अलग रूप में मिलता है तो सिर्फ हम आकार देख के अगर उसको इंटरप्रेट करने की कोशिश करेंगे तो कई भ्रांतियां पैदा हो सकती हैं इसलिए क्षेत्र को यहाँ की विविधताओं को यहाँ के ट्रेडिशंस को जानना जरूरी है उसके बाद अगर हम इनका अध्ययन करेंगे तो शायद हम जो है इतिहास को अच्छी तरह से समझ पाएंगे तो आर्कियोलॉजी कैन बी ए क्रेडिबल सोर्स वेन वी टॉक अबाउट नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडिया एंड in absence of written record then it becomes more important and we can find material evidence but again we have to see that the material evidence we have a very limited because most of the things which were used or built by the people here they used 
uh, organic material which did not survive. So we will have to find the areas where we can find them. Initial archaeological work in Northeast India was done as any other part of the country by civil and military officers of uh, British uh, government and Assam was annexed to British Empire in 1826. So they tried to investigate in different part of the reason and the first article was published on Assam in the Asiatic Researches Volume 2 that was uh, a translation of a uh, Arabic work in the English. So that shows the interest of British in Northeast India. And first independent article about temple ruins of Northeast, that is Assam, published in 1835. Again, in 1867, John Lubbock published a brief of a letter which was sent by Lieutenant Steele and reported finding of stone tools in the region. And after that, many British officers were writing about it. As I have mentioned earlier, archaeological survey came in existence in 1861, but their area was limited to the northwestern province and Bihar. So that time, no archaeologists from archaeological survey uh, worked in this area. And the pioneering work, if you see, was done by E. H. Steele in 1870. It was about the cells found among Namsang Nagas. Lieutenant Baron in 1872 wrote about the stone implements from Naga Hills. Gorbina Steen in 1872, 1876, he writes about the stone monuments of Khasi Hills. These were the officers who were going on different assignments in this region. And during their uh, visits, they used to find these and then they used to write about it. In 1874, he, uh, he wrote about the famous ruins of Dimapur, uh, which belongs to Kacharis or Dimasas. And in 1975, he wrote about the stone monuments of Naga tribes. J.M. Foster in 1872 wrote about Gargaon, that remains of Ahom period. And uh, Foster again in 74, he writes on the temple of Jaisagar, about which the first article has published uh, around uh, 40 years back. Clark writes on the monuments of Khasi Hills in 1874. And Gate wrote about the home coins in 1896. Edward G he get who was there, he wrote about the history of Assam. He collected all traditions, informations, based on his study on the coins, inscription, address, etc. He tried to write down the history of Assam and his work is still referred by all those who are working on the Northeast India. Again, the, his history of Assam is uh, really, in a sense, is the history of Northeast India. And then, uh, A.F.R. Horn, Hornley wrote in 1897 on Guwahati copper plate grants. So when these written documents came, the picture uh, became clearer. In 1889, the Eastern Circle was established in Calcutta of the Archaeological Survey of India. And the entire Northeast region came under the Eastern Circle. But it was far away from Calcutta. And you can imagine in that time, the transportation and other difficulties. So not much exploration or excavation uh, was done. What they did was all these monuments which were reported earlier, uh, they were taken care of and some work was done because they had a limited staff. The area of the Eastern Circle, they, there was only a few circles that time, not like now. And it was far away from Calcutta. It is a very difficult terrain. So going and working by anyone from outside was a very difficult thing. And it is it has been uh, mentioned also. So Ken Dikshit in 1920s, 21, 22, 
and R.D. Banerjee in 24-25, they worked, uh, carried out conservation work at Vishwanath, Tejpur, and Khaspur. That was done by uh, K.N. Dikshit. And uh, R.D. Banerjee worked at Gargaon, Sivsagar, and Kosamari Pathar, where there are monoliths, again, that is said to be the earliest phase of uh, Dimasa period. So these are the areas where some work was carried out. And in their reports, they had clearly mentioned that what problems uh, they faced there. And the first half 20th century, uh, the activities of concern about the cultural heritage, archeological remains, ancient monuments was realized by the local persons. And they played, uh, they have conducted very significantly. Uh, Padmanabh Bhattacharya, he very significantly wrote about the, uh, contributed greatly. In 1909, he uh, wrote about archaeological remains, remains at Tejpur. He also wrote about copper uh, plate grants of Bhaskar Varman, uh, Varman dynasty, which is famous and uh, in the early historical Assam. And it stepped it on, it stepped on, wrote on the coach coins in 1910. H.C. Das Gupta wrote about the shouldered stone implements in 1913. Coggin Brown's work on the grooved stone hammers. So now these tools which were found in this region started getting attraction and they are being interpreted in the same way. And all these tools were coming as a chance find. None of them were, you know, excavated. Whenever there was a fire, means the jungle was cleared for June cultivation, or if there is some digging, these tools were recovered. And then they were handed over to those who are interested and then they were studied. So, so far, no attempt was made to excavate and study them in the context. So it was only on the best of the finds and they were the mostly the chance finds. A.W. Botham also wrote about the home coins in 1914. Hutton wrote extensively. Uh, in 1922, he wrote about monoliths at Jamuguri and Dimapur. And they are uh, unique if you have seen or if you have uh, seen the photographs of these. This tradition of uh, monoliths, uh, which is associated with the Masa, well, this is uh, some very unique traditions and huge, beautifully carved monoliths of uh, the Masa period, which you find at Dimapur within the fort. And they are of different types and they have, uh, they also represent the traditional art and different forms. And of course, uh, they still need to be studied properly that the, why they were making this kind. And they were the only people who were making this kind of monoliths. So the Masas had this unique tradition, uh, which you find initially, and then at Dimapur you find it is a all evolved and well-developed use monoliths, beautifully decorated. And they are worth mentioning when we talk about art and the tradition of Northeast India. Uh, Hutton also wrote about uh, the carved stones in the Dayang Valley, megaliths of Jayantia Hills, carved stones as Kigwama and prehistory of Assam and on megaliths. So he extensively, it's uh, from 21, 22 to 29, around this uh, a decade, he worked on different aspects and have written, uh, contributed greatly. Mills and Hutton also wrote about ancient monoliths of North Kachar. And these monoliths, again, uh, let me mention, I'll not go in detail, but this is a very unique uh, tradition which you find only in the North Kachar Hills. They are, you can call it stone uh, jars or they are like the huge stone uh, pots. They are carved. Uh, they have a cavity, they have different shapes. And this tradition you find in Southeast Asia. And 
northeast uh, this north kachar hill which is now known as dimahasao and adjoining part of meghalaya is the only reason where this kind of monoliths are found and they are again is means they are the unique in their own sense and again they need to be studied properly not uh, much work has been done i'm talking about a more scientific work proper excavation proper analysis and uh, dating and identification that is again a very unique tradition so uh, this uh, jar type of uh, monoliths or megaliths in uh, dimahasao or north kachar hills again is a very unique tradition uh, jp mills uh, wrote about field work uh, field research in uh, 1933 then indian scholars also contributed uh and their contribution was really appreciable among them nk bhattasali he wrote about nidanpur grant of bhaskar verman kel barua he wrote about the prehistoric cultures uc choudhury on the batera copper plate grants in 1940 and pc choudhury on neolithic culture in 1944 so not only these individual and their contribution but that kamrup anusandhan samiti was formed to which gave a real boost to archaeological studies or the studies related to cultural heritage monumental heritage or the ancient remains in this region and since then uh, it really received a boost and a good number of scholars and enlightened uh, people from different areas they come together to work on the history or the past of the northeast india and kamrup anusandhan uh, samiti also published a journal they also established a museum which is now known as uh, assam state museum in guwahati so they contributed a lot towards the archaeology or heritage or past of india when i am using word archaeology again i am using in a common sense as it was used during that time i am not talking strictly about excavation as it should have been used scientifically but i am talking in that time i am talking what these people use the word then a lot of uh, scholars contributed towards the history and ethnographic studies in the region uh, i can just uh, list i am not going in the detail uh, e edward gate in uh, wrote about the his on jaintia history he also wrote about historical research in assam and as i have mentioned his work history of assam is still relevant and being referred by most of the people who are working in this area and then the history and uh, ethnology uh, there was good work on the garos a playfair road in 1910 on the jaintia kings a w botham road in 1940 prt gordon worked on khasis in 1940 hutton work on angami nagas sema nagas and po nagas and his works are still relevant and being referred by most of the people now we know in 1947 india became independent and the constitution was adopted on 26 january 1950 so india became a union of states and the works regarding heritage cultural heritage was divided among the states and the center now i want to talk about this so that you can understand this is what the situation before independence being away from the circle that was in calcutta and different local problems or issues not much work was done so people from here they did not go to that reason they did not do much work now india became independent then these several states were formed then what happened to understand it i just want to touch this aspect so the constitution of india divide responsibilities between its state and the center and the seventh schedule has different list list 1 mentioned that is the center list mention about all 
protected monument and protected sites they are the responsibility of the central government then all the remaining monuments they lies with the state government and all unprotected archaeological sites and remains they are in the concurrent list that is the list 3 accordingly the central government made a new law in 1958 and states also formulated their laws most of the state established department of archaeology and they had their law assam was a again the biggest state that time and they were very cute this is something which is appreciable that very quickly they implemented a law and this hurry uh, probably became a issue and which affected archaeological studies in this region so when india became independent there was a law which was implemented in 1904 ancient monument preservation act and that was on a different line because its purpose was different during british india so on the basis of this act assam state made their law and before the central government brought the new law as per the constitution of india assam government has made a law and before the central act was implemented it was in place so now it was heavily based on the provisions which were in the 1904 act and situation changed because when india became a union of uh, states now situation had changed now there was division of the responsibilities between a state and center and now center has to play a different role not only that the new law has a lot of things about the archaeological excavation which were not there in the earlier law because earlier their concern was not archaeological investigation but independent india thought about it and they made a proper wider more specific provisions so since this state law was made on the basis of earlier law so these all things were missing here so actually archaeology was somewhat missing in this law and when you do not have a legal provision definitely it is going to affect the work though of course if you see practically you will find that all the provisions of law are not being implemented but at least the provisions are there so if somebody wants can enact them or can work on that but here this happened that those provisions were not made also in that and as you know in the national scenario the archaeology function in a bit a different way and things could not be done as they should have been as per the legal provisions of the central act and the state acts so since assam uh, the assam mentioned monument and record act was based on 1904 uh, act there was no clear or proper uh, provisions for archaeological excavation and i feel i strongly feel that this uh, affected archaeological studies in northeastern region uh, very heavily because the excavation provisions which are made there in rules they were made only for the conservation of monument so you can understand so excavations were to be done there only for the conservation not for the study of the past or reconstruction of the history or to know or find the unknown you know the very spirit of the excavation was missing there and any government official would work on the line of the law it is expected from him he is not going to violate it and he will follow the law so the most of the archaeological excavation they were related more with the conservation 
more with the exposure of his structure instead of reconstruction of history or searching the unknown or building up a firm chronology of northeastern region, which is really required in absence of the uh, written documents in uh, since we have very limited uh, records that is inscriptions and very few monuments but since it was uh, the provisions were not made by mistake or by in haste so it affected the development of archaeological uh, activities then the new states were formed some of them uh, implemented their act some uh, followed because they were separated from the assam like meghalaya it does not have a state act so they are expected to follow because it was earlier part of the meghalaya and uh, in some other part because some of the parts or regions in northeast india uh, they comes and uh, they are autonomous councils and they are covered uh, comes under the ship schedule where the local autonomous councils have their autonomy to take decisions in certain area so there are certain legal uh, i won't say hurdle but there are certain legal issues which also affect archaeological study in this region so if i want to work in uh, i or any archaeological officer of the central government want to work in any part of the northeast uh, it's not possible if it is in uh, it comes under autonomous council he or she has to acquire permission from there and there are certain uh, areas where you don't have a provision to do uh, archaeological excavation by other agencies so you cannot do it legally so these are certain issues which affected the archaeological excavations in uh, this region and uh, definitely working in northeast region is a bit difficult task even john eliot in 1799 wrote and i quote to carry out archaeological research or any research must have been a daunting task unquote so even in the 18th century they wrote that working in this area because there are certain issues uh, the geography the language the difficult terrain uh, the nature so you have to deal with them and uh, so these are some of the issues which affected archaeological investigation in northeast india now i'll just try to touch some of the studies which have been carried out uh, there have been a number of excavation uh, i start with the northeast means the main state that is the assam or the ancient assam which covers the almost uh, whole northeast india but again as i have told since there is a provision in the law that excavation has to be related with the conservation so the state department of archaeology focused more on the excavation which are related or associated with the monuments and most of the excavation were uh, exposer of uh, ancient remains or ancient structures uh, guwahati university Uh, has a department of uh, archaeology where uh, they also deal with the prehistoric archaeology and they have done a uh, lot of field work in this area they were pioneer in this field and their focus was on archaeological finding the search of the remains uh, findings interpretation so their focus has been mainly on the field studies uh, mainly they focus on the prehistoric site or the stone age sites and they continuously worked on them of course they have worked on early historical sites but their major focus has been on the academic pursuits they try to find out the early deposits uh, study of the tools in the context uh, building a chronology building a typology and they work extensively regularly they did not lose their focus and they worked on uh, neolithic uh, excavations they conducted uh, they explored a good number of sites uh, earlier when uh, meghalaya was part of assam they were working in the uh, that region but even once it becomes a separate state they continue uh, their work in that region and have uh, produced good results uh, which uh, most of you are aware of and uh, 
Nagaland, uh, now the archaeology is picking up and some excavations are being conducted there. Uh, that is an area where not much has been done. Manipur is, Manipur is a state where the archaeology department as well as the university have carried out uh, excavations on prehistoric site, on a burial site, on the historical sites and they have done of course all these excavations were a uh, small scale on a very limited scale with limited funds with limited resources but they worked on these different kind of sites uh, they could get good results they have unearthed different types of remains and many of them have been published in different forms Mizoram is one state where not much work was done earlier. Uh, recently, Archaeological Survey of India has established a independent circle at Aizol, and that has given a boost to the archaeological studies. And now, regular excavations are being conducted. Areas, certain parts of the states are being uh, excavated and explored and which are giving a very unique uh, finds and very different results. And now definitely it will throw a very uh, useful light on the history of this region, which is adjoining the Burma. And there is, uh, uh, you know, the cultural connections uh, with the, uh, both sides of the uh, political boundary. So you are getting a new information. Tripura, there have been uh, excavations conducted by the Archaeological Survey of India and again, but these excavations were uh, more of, uh, of the mounds which were containing the structural remains. So if you see in Northeast India, most of the excavations have been the exposure of buried structural remains. Of course, in excavation, you find other antiquities which give you uh, uh, some information about the past societies, their cultures, their history. But the kind of excavation, what we expect, like a multicultural site where you get a different uh, deposits of different periods and then you get uh, remains so that you can build a chronology, that sorts of excavations are missing. And the reason being uh, that there have been no such, you know, huge uh, settlements where a large number of people living on a particular site for a very long time. As you are aware, Northeast India, there was a tradition of Joom cultivation. So people were living where they were cultivating. After cultivating that area for some time, they moved to a new place and then their settlement will also move. And there were not many big cities. Uh, when we talk about Northeast, uh, the reference come to Prague Jyotishpur, that is the modern Guwahati. And here the major excavation was conducted at a site which is known as Ambari. So this was a site which was uh, found by uh, chance when Reserve Bank of India was digging foundation for building its, uh, for constructing its building. Now they came across uh, different sculptures, pottery and other remains. And so this site was a chance discovery. After that, uh, State Department of Archaeology and uh, the Guwahati University, they have conducted a number of excavation. The site has also been excavated by the Archaeological Survey of India and the experts from Deccan College and experts from other institution were also, uh, they took part or they guided uh, the excavators and excavation have been conducted uh, for last almost, it's around 50 years from 60s, end of 60s uh, when the site was found. It has been excavated after uh, some gaps in different phases and number of structures have been found there. So the first archaeological excavation in Assam was conducted in 62-63. Uh, Simultaneously at two sites by two institutions. They were the Department of Archaeology, Assam government, 
they excavated at Deopani Thaan, uh, one site, where they, that was a sort of a salvage kind of thing. They excavated a structure and Gohati University excavated at Daujali Hadi, which, which is one of the most famous archaeological site in Northeast India that date back to Neolithic period. And uh, so this was the beginning of archaeological excavation in Northeast India. After that, as the beginning was made, university focused more on archaeological sites, finding the ancient remains, and the department, as per the legislation, focused more <coughs> on the sites which are uh, related with the uh, monuments, uh, as the spirit of the law say. So then a number of excavations were conducted. Deopani Khan as was the first, where the sculptures and the structures were found. In Daujali Harding, which was uh, excavated in 62, 63, 63, 64, uh, a deposit of around 45 centimeter uh, of Neolithic uh, period was found with the Neolithic tools, uh, ill-fired coarse pottery, bones, uh, corn grinders, mullers, pestle, etc. So that was the uh, first uh, finding of Neolithic tools and pottery from a proper context. Prior to that, most of the uh, tools were found from the surface. Jalukbari is a very small uh, excavation, but uh, it revealed a unique uh, finding, and that was a terracotta pot. Again, one thing I would like to tell you, there have been certain unique finds or some different finds uh, which are unique in their own way and, uh, you know, such things have not found anywhere in the country. But the focus of uh, archaeologists working in this area have been like finding things which are found in other parts of the country. So these unique finds which came up there, they did not get the proper attention. They they were not properly studied and they are uh, means a find of their own kind and they have a real value but they did not get the proper attention of archaeologists they did not get uh, proper uh, publication and studies so it was a huge boat made of uh, terracotta and uh, the, some pottery, it may be associated uh, with the burial uh, traditions. So this is a unique thing. There is another site uh, from uh, a nearby in a campus, university campus itself, where university conducted excavation. They found another terracotta boat. So that tradition is uh, unique, and these finds are uh, unparalleled anywhere else in the country and they deserve proper attention and proper study that we have to do it. Uh, as I have mentioned about the site, which is uh, very famous, again, like Daujali Harding is one, and Ambari is another site, uh, where the for last almost five decades excavations uh, have been done. And uh, if you study this site, perhaps it tells the whole story about archaeological sites in Northeast India. So first excavation was done in 68, 69, uh, jointly by State Department of Archaeology and uh, Gohadi University. And where more than 40 stone sculptures uh, of Vishnu, Agni, Nandi, Durga, a good number of Shivling and uh, Yonis of around uh, 19th century were found. And uh, there was a different uh, dressed stone dogs, there were structures a variety of pottery. Uh, the pottery included Chinese Saladin ware and the local or Mughal glazed ware, green glazed or bluish green glazed wares, uh, different types of beads of different material, uh, good number of coins, terracotta figurine, uh, different type of pottery which is made of uh, kaolin. Uh, kaolin is found in this region. So figures which are made of in, and some of the figures are so beautiful and artistically made that uh, they uh, stand in the front row of uh, any other uh, figurine or if you consider art 
as such. So in Indian art, they are not inferior to any other uh, art of any other period, particularly a dancing uh, woman or a dancing girl or lady. It's a beautifully uh, Keolin uh, figurine. It has no parallel in Indian art. So there have been beautiful finds in this region, uh, but the in-depth study which should have been to find the connection, find the purpose, find the areas or centers where they have been made. An excavation which uh, uh, conducted at uh, uh, Ambari has produced semi-finished or half-finished uh, sculptures in large number which suggest that uh, they have been made there. So it's not, it's like a, you know, an art center where these sculptures were made. And there are a similar type of good number of other sculptures. So there are some, I mean, it's a very important site. But again, uh, for several years by different agencies, it has been excavated, but the final results are still awaited. And uh, recent, uh, the last work which was done by the Department of Archaeology and the Archaeological Survey of India, where they have tried to uh, fix a chronology starting from 2nd century BC to 3rd century uh, CE, that is the period one they put it, period two they put from 7th to 14th century, which was earlier established, of course. So from 7th century onward, the cultural deposits as Ambari were not were known and the last excavation tried to put an earlier phase to that one and then thus another phase is from 15th century to 17th century and then 18th, 19th century. But this site has not been excavated fully. All these excavations were focused or were limited to the upper strata because of the water level which is very high there they have uh, not reached to the natural soil or the early deposits in this uh, at these sites are yet to be excavated it's not uh, impossible it is not difficult it can be done but that has not been done and that is one of the issue i'll be uh, touching about it there are a number of other excavation i don't want to go in a specific uh, as I have told, most of them were more of the uh, exposure of a structure like the Nanath in 84, 85 excavation was done where a good number of uh, uh, structures were exposed and these brick structures were beautifully decorated with uh, plaques, uh, beautifully decorated plaques, a good number on all the sites. And, uh, Big wall had around 30 plaques and on the sides there were uh, 23. They belongs to around 14th, 15th century. Archaeological survey conducted uh, excavation at Dabar Vatiya and a, one of the major excavation I can call a world major or a place where Archaeological Survey of India conducted excavation on a little uh, large scale was Surya Pahar where they have got a lot of structures uh, Buddha image, terracotta plaques, decorated bricks, pottery, etc. And uh, universities have been working. Uh, Siv Sagar uh, excavation was done by the ASI, but again, they exposed one Maidam, that is a burial mound of a home period, and at the Kerangar, that is called Talakalghar. Uh, so the exploration was also carried out in different districts. I can just name in the Kamrup, Dharam, Sonipur, Lakhipur, Shiv Sagar, Dima Sao, Dubri, Golhar, uh, Karbi Anglong, Bor Pathar, uh, these uh, and many other Dharam, Sonipur, Lakhimpur, Shiv Sagar, they all were excavations were done. But the issue uh, which I would be flagging, flagging uh, at the end that these all excavations are being done more or less you know in isolation different institutions are working on different uh, sites with their limited capacity the one thing which is really uh, you can mark is that there have not been 
a planned approach to study the history of Northeast region or the history of a particular uh, group. I don't use the word tribe. So like there has not been a proper project or a plan to study the archaeological remains or of a homes or archaeological remains of the masas or a cultural sequence or archaeological remains on a particular site systematically for a couple of years where you you know you have certain objectives you want to know certain issues and then you want to achieve them so that kind of approach was uh, missing not only in one state i am talking the entire this region all these states uh, whether you talk about sikkim there has hardly been work uh, some work has been done again uh, it's because of a government policy as you know the government of india has to spend a part of their budget in northeast india so the dif different departments they earmark certain funds for northeast and under that fund they go and do some work so that has been on the basis of the allotment of the fund it is not a planned project so what is really needed for northeast india is planned approach which is missing till today i am saying till today that approach is not there it is being done in bits and pieces as a result that uh, the desired results have uh, not been achieved there is another issue about the education and training uh, there was no institution for around 60 years in Northeast India uh, uh, teaching archaeology. Uh, Guwahati University, Department of Anthropology, uh, was doing the work, but they were not teaching archaeology as such. Uh, in 2010, Assam University uh, established a center for archaeology and museology, and they introduced, uh, we introduced uh, some papers on archaeology, art, epigraphy, museology, uh, so that students of uh, history in post-graduation may opt uh, some of these papers. Uh, recently, uh, Cotton University, which is based in Guwahati, uh, they have started uh, uh, Department of Archaeology, which is a good beginning and good number. It is attracting good number of students from the region. Uh, Nagaland University is now uh, taking a lead and doing it. Uh, Northeastern Hill University, uh, they are working. They have got a Department of History and Archaeology. So very recently, there have been, uh, uh, you know, a sort of awakening. And now the education in the field of archaeology is being imparted. And recently, even uh, the history and museology paper has been introduced even in the undergraduate. Uh, that's a very good thing so that the student when come to post graduation he has some background of the archaeology and uh, i tell you because uh, the population and settlements in northeast india are so scattered that it becomes difficult for an outsider to come and explore the reason so if the uh, students or youth of this reason is educated or trained in this field they can explore their area or nearby areas and they can bring out uh, many uh, hidden uh, uh, treasures i'll call the word treasures these remains uh, which generally to which people do not go uh, they are not in limelight they are far away from the residential areas uh, they are in dense forests they are on hills or in the marshy areas so this training of archaeology or in related field is going to give a real boost which was uh, awaited there and as we all know that awareness and public participation that is the key for archaeological studies field studies discoveries finding of preservation of cultural heritage since this reason was uh, sort of avoided there was not much interaction with experts and the local communities. So there, there the awareness about uh, the archaeological remains is low. Of course, these communities are very well aware about their cultural heritage. 
and uh, you would surprise to know that very recently a good number of uh, museums have been established in all these states of northeast india and most of them are having ethnographic collections collections from local communities and uh, that is a very uh, appreciable effort by local people many of them are the private museums or they are established by uh, local institutions where they are trying to preserve these heritage so a sort of awakening is coming but involving public at large and interaction between experts and the common man that is the need because unless there is a public support unless public is aware about the importance of these cultural remains cultural heritage and archaeological remains uh, it is difficult for any institution or uh, uh, individuals to protect them to study them to discover them because that's a, a very difficult task so if public joins hand with the experts or with this institution which are responsible for preservation of cultural heritage the task become very easy and we know the heritage belongs to people and it is they who have to take care of it it is they who have to preserve it these institution and experts can give them the expert advice but it belongs to them so the archaeology is really very important particularly in northeastern india i am talking about arunachal assam manipur meghalaya mizoram nagaland uh, tripura sikkim because their written documents are very few monumental heritage is limited population is limited terrain is difficult highly means thickly forested areas in the past most of the things used were made of the organic material perishable material which did not exist now you have got very limited very scattered archaeological remains unless there is a planned approach where all these agencies which are concerned with cultural heritage department of archaeology museums universities college and schools forest department defense institutions security agencies unless they all come together and have awareness and work along with their real task then it is difficult to search recover analyze and interpret cultural heritage of northeast india though despite all these difficulties pioneers and scholars in the past have done a wonderful job they have brought to light many important archaeological remains but their analysis and study is still awaited they have yet to be recognized and to receive their due place in the overall scenario and therefore the person who are working or who are living in northeast india sometimes feel uh, a sort of isolation and often if you talk to people there uh, they use the word northeast india and mainland india so this divide of northeast india and mainland india has to be bridged and that will be bridged academically we have to recognize the unique finds in this region we have to work more we have to take or associate with the agencies in the region and experts who are out of the region and if we collectively work then we will be able to reconstruct the history of india in a better way so i stop with this and uh, if there is some comments or a discussion i would be happy to learn from all of you thank you 
Thank you, <coughs> Professor Kumaraji. Uh, it was a systematically delivered a foundation lecture on the investigation on the archaeological investigations of Northeast, because uh, you have already said that the mainstream media, mainland India, northeastern India, this is the divide, uh, divide. This is the mental divide that we have deliberately created, and we don't want to know much about Northeast. We have just forgotten the contribution of, you know, Ahom dynasty, 600 continuous years, and they have the power to rule right from the village to the urban centers. Their their functionaries were there in the villages also, and we have, you know, Dimasa. I have worked in the Dimahasao area, in the complete Dimahasao, and in that Nagaland, you know, I was the in charge of Northeast Culture Center of Indira Gandhi Research Center for the arts. I was in charge for five years. And Dr. K. K. Chakravarti was my boss. He is watching this program. Thank you, sir. For I invited him to be the part of uh, uh, you know this uh, lecture, and he has gracefully accepted it and watching. He told me even the you know the missionary people, those who have written about the northeast about the intangible thing, they should be weighed again. We should they should be weighted again. So there was a professor B. K. Rao Burman. And Professor B K Rai was one by working with us. So we made a committee, you know, and the committee was. And I was looking after the thing, and then we went to the people. We re-evaluating the customary law about, but the people again the mainland people should know that the polo game was initiated in the north of India in Manipur. That was the. Manipur is the first place in the world where the polo game was started, and that I am telling you in front of an archaeologist. You know, and then the Pakhangwa dynasty we 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 talked about, and you know, you know that Garib Nawaz and all those things we did. You know, there are many things that can be done, and not. And then one thing, you know, we are always talking about the ethno history, ethno archaeology. And you have very clearly stated that if you don't integrate the people with your vision, with your plan, and if you don't integrate all the agencies and organizations doing excavations in you know scattered manner with various objectives, so you we have to follow an integrated approach where in the role of ethnography. And ethno archaeology is very very essential. When we say ethno archaeology, I here mean by ethno archaeology is something where the engagement of the people is very very essential. You try to understand the folklore of any tribe, and in the folklore, in the folk song, you will come to know that they are giving a continuous you know, story of their arrival to that place, and before. Before that, where were they? And before that, where were they? So you know, you can create a mental landscaping, mental escapings of their heroic, you know, deeds and all those things that they have done. And this can be done. So you know, most of the people have have appreciated uh, your presentation, sir. But there are few things that uh, that have that have come. Uh, like you say that what what is the uh, outcome of Professor? Uh, Goswami's, uh, you know, all excavation works and books that uh, one man like he said, Doctor Sri Kumar Jha is asking. Uh, I, I, I am just asking his question. Any monuments of Mongoloids in Northeast archaeological excavations? So do you have answer to this question? I don't know how you manipulate it. Any monuments of mono uh, uh, Mongoloids in Northeast archaeological? excavations this is the question okay, would you okay. like to this? Uh, okay. yes yes i would like because what do you mean by mongoloid monuments monuments are monuments they are not yeah, mongoloid yeah. they are not uh, negroid see we have to change our this mindset now even i don't want or i don't means i never use this word like a home monument or divasa monument because now we are living in a stage where we say human heritage we are talking about world heritage 
a monument constructed by anyone anywhere belongs to the entire humanity and if you see a monument as a mongolite monuments or a negroid or astrolite uh, i think you are doing injustice to a monument and as a heritage uh, lover uh, i never do that and please don't do that so there are monuments of different periods of different dynasties and different groups and all sort of monuments have been uh, found uh, and being found as i told you there has been a very limited uh, excavations or works in this region and they have not been a very you know and this is not forget about the region and let's talk about india we are not doing excavation of because we have certain issues to solve we are doing excavation if we get funds we excavate or i have to excavate because he has excavated four sites i have to excavate four more so this kind of approach we are having in archaeology that's why at a national level we have to think that which are the areas in our history which need to be addressed and who are the agencies who should work there and how we should work there so we have to bring this you know national thinking or a regional thinking and this reason which are the areas where we have to focus and all of us should work on that we should contribute whatever we can do it so our approach should be to reconstruct the history as a whole not exposing the structure or collecting the antiquities that is what i wanted to mention when i said the wheeler school of training wheeler did not train indian to become archaeologist he very clearly writes yeah, yeah. in ancient india one that he was training so we are going with the trained supervisor mentality in the field we have to go as an archaeologist okay i was apprehensive about using this term you know mongolite because i am a student of anthropology and race is something that we have almost all totally forgotten it is no no yes. more exist in our minds anyway the, 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 that was that was very uh, uh, this thing but a scanty thing but you answered second question that he had what did rc sharma and goswami find in their uh, yeah see both of these uh, persons uh, they are the pioneers uh, again both of them from the uh, guwahati university anthropology department they have done a lot of uh, work commendable job in the archaeology field but as i told you that these excavations i am uh, if i am not wrong probably no excavation in northeast india has been uh, fully completed and reports published because they have been done on you know uh, some work has been done some reports have come some articles have come and the whole material has not been studied whereas the sites like these two which i have mentioned particularly uh, where both of them have worked that is uh, dawjali hadding in context of uh, neolithic and uh, the ambari for early historical uh, because it's within the city and uh, it's a, it is one of the center which remain under occupation uh, for over a thousand years so these are two very important sites but different people came in different periods they worked and finally we do not have uh, the proper knowledge which could have been generated by those studies and that is what we need that's that is the point i wanted to make we have to build up the chronology of the reason based on the findings from these all sites and we need to have a systematic efforts for that and the material is still there of course now these people are no more with us but the material which they retrieved is still with different agencies even it is possible and when i went to northeast india uh, let me tell you here on this forum i made some attempt to contact those who were working on these sites to and i uh, gave them a proposal that let us work and uh, uh, what on these sites and you know bring out the results uh, but i fail but it still it has to be done because otherwise there is no point of doing this all work which has been done uh, so unless the fourth part i told you excavation has search retrieval 
analysis and interpretation unless we reach to the this analysis and interpretation the search and retrieval has no value it's not that just you put them in a museum and the work done that's a wrong approach unless you have to reach on the conclusion reconstruct the history then the purpose of excavation or field work serves so we have to reach to that goal sir thank you before we conclude can i steal your five more minutes and tell you to talk briefly about the kachari dimasa kacharis and their show sure. yes pardon dimasa kacharis their 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 history archaeology and contribution okay 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 so uh, i'll tell you in very brief dimasas are a community again i'll call them a local indigenous group again one thing as uh, you were mentioning about british uh, officers they have uh, reported certain things in the census reports or in their two diaries and you know what happened that uh later scholars indians uh, they blindly followed them and even that have created certain problems because these many of the names which we talk today about khasis uh, dimasas bodos kacharis many of these terms were even referred by uh, brought by these uh, british officers even if you go and talk to the local community they will say what is this we don't call ourselves like that so uh, sometimes they were called lusai sometimes they were called khasi sometimes they were called kuki so these are the terms they got from somewhere and then they recorded and then we scholars just copy them so when we talk about kacharis uh, what the history we know uh, their first place where uh, we find kachari remains is uh, kachamari where we have this monoliths around 20 monoliths and they are of one type and then we have this chess board uh, type one and then they moved from there to dimapur dima they say dima is a made of uh, two words d means river and or water and ma means the sun so sons of the water or the great water or great river uh, they interpret in dimasa language so that was the capital and and again this uh, monoliths of uh, dimapur again i tell you they are unique you such things are not found anywhere else in the country they were having uh, different kind of uh, monoliths huge one uh, we still do not know what was their purpose why they were making it they need proper study from dimapur when they were attacked they had a war with the homes then they moved uh, to uh, the valley uh, i just forgot the name if i get it so they established their capital there and from there then they moved to the khaspur which is very close to the silchar that was their last capital and after that their uh, kingdom was annexed by the british and these uh, dimasas has a, a unique tradition of building uh, structures and they made a use in dimapur they had a huge fort the gate is still survive and the british record if we see we find it was a huge fortified area where they were living and inside again of course we find only thing what survive is these monoliths and uh, other structures and all as we know they were made of uh, wood and bamboos as because from the burangi we get lot of information how these palaces were made so we get information from there and then what we get besides that are the ponds which they had made uh, so these ponds are still there we have the fortifications we have the monoliths and monoliths tradition continued on all the sides and even they made a monolithic structure which is again unique uh, in northeast india uh, i am just missing the name of that place Uh, so it is still there it's a protected monument uh, it is protected by it is the it government is of it india it is so in dima so this is I'm what uh, uh, dima yeah yeah i'm just forgetting 
But anyway, yeah, yeah. So that's a place I have been. So that's a place that was the uh, third capital. And uh, one of my scholar is working. Uh, he has done some work on. I done research on that. And still, the work is going on. Uh, we have recently published two papers on them, and we are still working on them. And I hope we will be able to bring out some more facts about uh, the Masa. But again, about uh, because these terms still create some problems or some confusion because they are used in different sense with different communities. So we have to be a bit careful about it, and we should try to go back to the communities and to find out that what is the real meaning or uh, what they call themselves. Because this British record, uh, if you see chronologically, you find they changed because up to certain period, they were referring one company by one name and then they changed the name. So that has happened. So we have to be careful about that also. We initiated this project also. You know, we, we invited people from various fields. And, they, and we used to tell them, you, you name all the words and phrases that you have been using and what are the English and Hindi equivalent or Assamia equivalent to, the, to these words. And they did this, we didn't publish it. And we were doing this, we did it for, uh, for five years. And after that, I left that job. Uh, anyway, we'll do it. And uh, uh, thank you so very much, sir, for your coming to this uh, platform and delivering such a wonderful base lecture on the archaeology of Northeast India, which is a beautiful place with 176 tribal scholars. Tribals all have their narratives, roles, lores, folklore, dress pattern, cuisines, and many more things. They are very nice people. And you have presented a master lecture Thank you so very much, sir, for accepting our invitation and uh, presenting your lecture. Thank you so very much, sir. Namaskar. Thank you for inviting me, giving this platform, having a discussion with all. And I'm really thankful to all, all the listeners and to organizers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So this was Professor Alok Tripathi. Tomorrow, again, we have to come with some more people kal jo hamare sath aayenge unka naam hai bani bharadwaj he is a socialite social worker doctor ki beti hai ek bhu ke professor ki patni hai bahut acha kaam karti hai hum unke sath interact karenge aur dekhenge ki mahila ka sar kis disha mein ja raha hai kis tarah se wo kaam kar rahi hai aap logo ko kal ke liye bhi aamantrit karta hu tab tak ke liye namaskar dhanyawad thank you